how would you, you help you with that design? How would you help with that design? You first, first, first. How would you help with that design? Well, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, Dapper Dinosaur here. Welcome back to another episode of Fluffy Dino Lads, featuring me, a decidedly non-fluffy dino, and in his image, a guy whom I genuinely like, but who is also not very good at paleontology or comparative morphology. Well, grab your beverage of choice, and a snack, and let's dig into the next part of his video. Or mammary glands, take your pick. They have a complicated one-way respiratory system. I won't get into that, but it is very different. It's the only kind of vertebrate with this kind of respiratory system. Oof. Except that pterosaurs and theropods also had these kinds of respiratory systems. And we know that sauropods had extensive air sacs around the spinal column, so they seem to have had it as well. Additionally, some lizards have a simpler, but still similar, respiratory arrangement. It's very different than what we find in mammals, it's very different than what we find in reptiles. Well, except for those reptiles that weren't birds, but that did have an avian-type respiratory system. You know, the dinosaurs that gave rise to birds. No diaphragm, by the way. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, they have pneumatic bone. Most, if not all, of their bones are pneumatic bone. Now, pneumatic bone is not a defining feature because even humans have some pneumatic bone. But pneumatic bone is a big deal. All right? They have very good vision. Birds can see incredibly well. Well, most birds have excellent vision, but kiwis don't. And, of course, most mammals have excellent senses of smell. But humans don't. In contrast, humans also have better vision than many birds. I wouldn't say keen eyesight is a diagnostic characteristic for birds, plus it's pretty hard to get a good grasp on the visual acuity of fossil taxa. And they have a keel on their sternum. Now, whenever I said standard sternum, um, I just meant said that birds do not actually have the standard sternum. They don't. They have a specialized structure on the sternum called a keel. Okay, if it doesn't have a keel, it's not a bird. Got it. And what the keel does is the keel basically... Um, is attachment for flight muscles. Flight muscles are big, strong. They tend to be what we eat when we eat bird. Um, so you need they need to be very big, very strong to power the bird through the air, and they need specialized attachment places, hence the keel. All right, a few more bird traits here. They have what's called a sensacrum. A sensacrum is a very, very, very <laughs> uh, specialized hip bone structure. It's a fusion of 10 to 24 different bones, uh, and what this does is it makes things a lot more lightweight because it fuses some vertebrae with the three bones of the hip, uh, decreases weight, increases stability. It does not give you a whole lot of flexibility, but you don't need flexibility, you need strength. Ooh, but you see, all dinosaurs have a sensacrum, even the least bird-like dinosaur you can think of. Uh, then they have the nasal conch here, the turbinates, like I was talking about a moment ago with the reptiles. Reptiles do not have these. Um... Birds do. What these do is they warm and moisten air as it comes through the uh, nostrils. And what that does is it allows the bird to be able to um, breathe even in cold altitudes. You know, high altitudes with their cold air helps them breathe. This is, by the way, a feature of warm being warm-blooded that is not found in dinosaurs. Except they are found in dinosaurs, and not in all birds. They have, most birds have a roughly similar body plan. Um, roughly speaking, it's, uh, not identical, but the, the body plan's fairly similar. This is too vague for me to really know what to do with it. What does being similar mean? How similar do the body plans have to be? I could point out that they have the same body plan as a human, if we're going to zoom out to a large enough taxon. Um, no diaphragm, as I mentioned earlier. All right, and this is a bird skeleton. I've highlighted a couple of key points. Note where the knee is on the leg. That need, that's up inside the bird's body. I didn't mention that in the bird traits, but it's up inside the bird's body. Bird knees, um, what we think of as a bird knee is actually the bird ankle. Well, the knee isn't inside the body. It's just usually not easily visible. But yes, if you ever thought that a bird knee was backwards, it's because you're looking at the animal's ankle. Um, the bird knee is drawn up inside the body. This is because of the balance point. The uh, little area that my arrow um, right above the word femur is pointing to, that is what is called the piga style. It's a short, bony bird tail. And note that you don't get a whole lot of weight there, and there's no weight really in the sensacrum, which is what this big arrow right above there is pointing to. So if a bird did not have its point of, if tried to walk from its hip, like we do and like dinosaurs do, it would fall flat on its face because all its weight is forward. 
But dinosaurs don't all have their center of mass at about their hips. Many had it forward of that, including some theropods that weren't birds, like Therizinosaurus, which due to being too front heavy, probably stood with their spines at a considerable angle to the ground, somewhat like birds, and unlike other theropods who kept their spine mostly parallel to the ground. Whereas by bringing the point of balance forward to where the knee arrow is, the arrow pointing to the knee is, um, it puts some more weight behind so that it basically allows it to balance a little bit more easily. Um, and then you have the sternum with the keel on it. You can see that there in the front. Um, keels don't fossilize too well uh, because they're not actually made of bone. Before this, I had never heard the claim that the keel of a bird sternum isn't made of bone. I've been trying to find something to confirm this, but I can't find any sources claiming this. And everything I have found refers to the sternum as simply a bone. Further, all the pictures I can find of bird sterna that are photographs of actual skeletal material all seem to have a keel made of bone. I honestly do not know where in his image got this claim. But it's there for reference purposes. All right, now this is a bone skeleton. This is a bird skeleton. Note that the knee is kind of disarticulated out of the body. It needs to be drawn up into the body. Wait, he's not going to cover the fused metatarsal bones? The fused fingers? Those are pretty darn characteristic of birds. Also, those legs were definitely not used like a modern bird's legs. And I know this because there's a long, bony tail for counterbalance. So even if, in his image, we're right about bird knees being outside the body, this animal didn't have knees like that. And I know because that's Archaeopteryx, which isn't really a bird in the traditional sense. And I know it's Archaeopteryx. In fact, that's the Solnhofen specimen discovered in the 1970s and originally classified as Compsognathus. In fact, this picture of the Solnhofen specimen was taken by David Bresson and featured on the Forbes website. And in his image, should know it's not a bird because it has a completely standard sternum. So by his own rules, this has to be a reptile. Note that the tail lacks any neural or hemal spines whatsoever. That's true, but in fact, modern bird tails do have neural spines on the free caudal vertebrae. So I'm not sure why this is counted in favor of this not being a reptile, but definitely being a bird. Basically, with the length of the tail, that tail is not going to flex, it's not going to bend, it's going to be very straight because it has very little to no muscular attachment. Right, like a tetanurin tail. Tetanurin is the clade of dinosaurs that includes animals like Apocanthosaurus, T. rex, and Cryolophosaurus. The name means stiff tail, and the stiff tail is most pronounced in the most bird-like dinosaurs, like Deinonychosauria which includes animals like Velociraptor, which, in fact, has been interpreted as a secondarily flightless bird by Alan Fiducia, the creationist's favorite paleoornithologist. And note also that the hip is rather sensacrum-like. Right, so it had a dinosaur hip. Although it's curious you didn't go into the fact that all dinosaurs, furs included, have an open acetabulum. That's a pretty important feature, and is basically a dead giveaway that you're working with a dinosaur. After this, in his image gives a little joke about scientists more or less making up feathered dinosaurs for grant money, of course, grant money doesn't go into a scientist's pocket, and most paleontologists are not well paid, so I don't know why anyone thinks this is viable, but then I'll give in his image the benefit of the doubt and say it was just a joke and not meant to be seriously considered. Yeah. Feather dinosaurs. There's 46 that I was able to find that were claimed. There was a nice convenient list um, of different creatures that were claimed to be feathered that were also claimed to be dinosaurs. It's probably the list on Wikipedia. It's actually a pretty good list. Um, and I submit that, that of those 46... There are no feathered dinosaurs, and we'll get to that in just a moment. And I submit that they are all feathered dinosaurs. All right, by the way, the image is of, in, is of Aurornus, which is what we're going to talk about first. Aurornus. Now, Aurornus is a very interesting bird. It's called the Break of Dawn bird. All right? Now, the, now a couple of things to point out here. Aurornus was not dug out of the ground. As cool as it is, it was not dug out of the ground. Because, and the reason it wasn't dug out of the ground, is it was purchased. Okay, I'm not trying to be a dick here. I'm really not. I like in his image, but come on. It had to be dug out of the ground in order to be purchased. But it was purchased from a fossil dealer who said that it had been unearthed in Yaluguo Liaoning. And analysis on the Matrix has since confirmed this. So it's not like it just fell out of the sky and onto the lap of a lucky fossil dealer. Like a lot of fossils in China these days, it was purchased... Um, through a fossil dealer. So we have no idea what the habitat area it was found in was. We have no idea if it has been doctored. Yeah, we do. It hasn't. And we know where it's from. Modern microscopy, UV fluorescent photography, analysis of the rock, etc. are able to spot fake fossils quite easily. That's why no scientists were fooled by the so-called Archaeoraptor. Although it is true that there was at one point some question as to whether this specimen came from the Yixian formation rather than the Yaolugo formation. All right, uh, Dr. Vili Shiap, who... Chiap is a, uh, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, it's C-H-I-A-P-P-A, -P -P -A, I think, or P-P-E, rather. Um, but 
he is um, something of an expert in fossils. He's described multiple birds, uh, multiple fossil birds, multiple fossil dinosaurs. He's, he's fairly well known in the community of paleontology. And he said, told science a number of years ago, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but basically what he said was, you know, it's just as easy for a counterfeit fossil to fool a fossil expert as it is for an art forgery to fool an art critic. I couldn't find this quotation by El Chapi or Chapa, I don't know how to say his name, who is a scientist who publishes on Mesozoic birds. But then again, I'm not subscribed to the publication, so I can't say for sure. But the fact is, there was no issue number or article name, and he wasn't just directly quoting but paraphrasing from memory, so that means I just don't believe this is a real quotation that he read. He might have seen it on a creationist website or heard it in a creationist lecture or something, no matter. The fact is that fossil fakes are not that hard to identify with proper training and equipment which, fortunately, paleontologists have. And the correct comparison isn't that paleontologists are to fossils as art critics are to art. It's more like paleontologists are to fossils as art restorationists are to art. These are people who know fossils in detail, and know when something is off. There was a time when paleontology was less advanced, and so was technology, and you could, with only a little bit of effort, pass off a modified orangutan jaw as a human ancestor's jaw. That time is long gone. Now, if the... It's doable. Fossil forgery is a real problem coming out of China. It was even featured in CNN not that long ago. Um, it is a big deal. It is a big deal, but not because lots of fake fossils are entering the literature. It's that in the field, they're not always easy to spot, so time and money is wasted on them, only to find that they are forgeries or composites, and so all the research into a possible new find has to just be flushed down the toilet. All right, so Aurorinus... I'm going to flop back to this here. Note that there, in the first image here on the left, we have... Um, we definitely have feathers, or definitely at least some form of feathers um, there, and note that they do attach down to the bone. Note also that the tail lacks any hemo or neural spines, and basically um, is one straight rod out into the end. My favorite part of this is that in his image has just described a velociraptor tail or a troodon tail, just as well as an auroranus tail. And over on the right here you can look at the hip, it's a little hard to see, but that is kind of a sensacrum shaped hip. Right, because having a sin sacrum is a key dinosaur trait. So Aurorinus is most likely a bird. Um, now I'm going to use, I'm going to classify things as either bird or some bird dinosaur, or I will hedge it. And if I hedge it on a particular one, I will tell you so. The very fact that you have to hedge your bets on dinosaur or bird, even with such a complete and well-preserved fossil, is in itself an argument that birds are a subset of dinosaur. I'm not going to show every animal he goes through, as there are about 40 of them. I'm just going to give a few highlights. All right, now a pedoraptor is a partial specimen. It's incomplete. There's no, fe there's no legs or tail. Feathers are inferred from what are called quill knobs. Quill knobs. Now, what are quill knobs? Uh, basically, they're evolutionist way of trying to put feathers where they don't find any evidence of feathers. Um, quill knobs are basically little marks on the um, usually the forearm of a creature that indicate, supposedly, that there at one point were feathers attached. Now, there are quill knobs found on fossil birds. No question. And also on bird bones, because the feathers do attach directly to the bone. I mean, they're evolutionist way to infer feathers in the same way that a coracoid process on a mammal is the evolutionist way to infer that the animal had a bicep. They infer that because, well, that's what a coracoid process is for. It's just for anchoring the proximal end of the bicep. Quill knobs are the anchor point on the ulna and digit 2 for anchoring primary feathers. Those are the big feathers that you see flared out at the trailing edge of a bird wing. And if you ask a child to draw a bird wing, the only feathers the child is likely to draw is the primaries. It's hard to see why you'd need quill knobs if you don't have quills. However, you still have a problem. Because... On birds, they're very organized, they're very orderly, they're very spaced, everything is just so. On things like a paddoraptor, they aren't. They're not straight, they're off-center, they're crooked, they're too close together, yada yada yada. Alright, so a paddoraptor... Well, I can't speak to a paddoraptor quill knobs, but let's take a look at the quill knobs of some other taxa, such as Dakota raptor and Velociraptor. As you can see, these knobs are not a mess of jumbled bumps. They follow the trailing margin of the bone and are quite evenly spaced. If in his image wants to discount such obvious marks of primary feather attachment, he's going to have to do a lot better than mistakenly saying they're jumbled. Yeah, I've had a raptor probably didn't look like that. <laughs> now it is just one fossil, so I'm hedge hedging this just a little bit and saying probably, but yeah, based on what we've got, a pedoraptor did not look like that. 
Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. We've been given no reason to dispute that life construction, though. But with examination as to the avian identity of a pateraptor, I will take my leave. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to hit like, and if you're not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you're always notified when there's more Dapper Dino content. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to thank my patrons, especially my Diapsid and Above patrons, Ben Tovind, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, Bob Knob, and The Evil Scotsman. In this time of global difficulty, the support of my patrons means a lot to me. If you would like to join the team, a link to my Patreon is in the description. The first tier is only a dollar, and you can get access to the exclusive patron-only Discord server. If a monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you'd still like to support the channel, I also have a Teespring store and an Amazon wishlist, both linked in the description. Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.